we only have one chapter this week. Next week will be three chapters. So I'm glad that uh, you came this week. Okay, dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this uh, wonderful Sunday that we can still openly gather and worship you freely. This freedom is fragile. We pray for your preservation. But while we have it, let us enjoy it. Open your word. Let the light shine in our soul. And uh, give us truth. Give us obedience. Give us blessing. And let us give you glory. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We're studying the book of Job, relating to God while suffering in life. Not an easy job to do. Okay? This is lesson number eight. You must shut up. Job's chapter 11. Okay. Now, the background is given in Job 1 to 2, and uh, it basically gave us a con contrast and a problem. Okay. A righteous man is blessed. That's good. That's what it should be if the universe is moral. But this righteous man is suffering. Well, that's wrong. Something is wrong. Either he's not righteous or God is unjust. Well, neither is is acceptable. <laughs> well, if we have to choose one, well, then he must be unjust. See, that was the friend idea. When you have a simplistic, moralistic uh, universe uh, in as your worldview. Okay, so the in the book of Job, after the opening scenario, which was unknown to the persons in the story, but known to us. Okay, if without that, we would not understand these at all. But with that, we can give objective critique. Okay. So Job began the discussion. In chapter 3, he basically said, why should I live? I have lost my family. I'm bankrupt. I'm sick as dead. Okay? I described as him as a, what is it? A, a, a puddle of pus in a crust of dust. Wow. E e you know, e what kind of life is that? Okay? So he says, why should I live? Then his friend joined in trying to help him. Okay? The first friend, Eliphaz, was probably from Edom because of the town he lived in. And then he was maybe the most balanced person, the most rational and uh, um, maybe phlegmatic in personality. So he's balanced. He doesn't offend people. So he's a rational person. But he challenged Job's presupposition that he was righteous. He said, after I thought this through, friend, I love you, but I'm sorry. I think you are punished for sin. Okay? And then Job's answer is, but where was I wrong? I can't find it. You can't find it. All you can is to surmise. And I don't think your accusation, even with good intention, is correct. Okay? And then his second friend, Bildad, um, uh, who, whose name means uh, the Lord has loved, and he was an emotional person. He got annoyed. He called Job a windbag, <laughs> and uh, he, he said, you must repent, okay? And he used simplistic logic trying to persuade him. And then Job's answer is, I will argue my case before God because you won't listen. I have to go to God, but woe to me. God is too holy for me to stand before him. I pray, I dream of a mediator who can stand before God, and he has to be holy. But I don't know if he could exist. So woe to me. Okay? Now today, we're dealing with the third friend, Zohar. Okay? His theme is, you must shut up. Okay? Now, what happens when your arguments failed, when your reasons have exhausted? What do you do? Do you examine your presupposition and do you, uh, you find your uh, proof text to look for the uh, context, see if you have really quoted them correctly? Or do you consider the other's opinion? Do you look for their proof text, see if you can explain them away? And that is really what a fair-minded, rational person should do if you want to build up a a good argument, Bible-based uh, argument, 
and that is biblical. However, that is not many people do. They have a system of presupposition which are actually premises that a, they assumed by tradition, which are not supported by the Bible, but they assume it and they are dug in. They're not going to challenge because that will make them dizzy. The world, if your presuppositions are shaken, the world becomes dizzy. Okay? And then you know what happens when people have, what was that? If your ear doesn't work right? Or yeah, vertical. If you have vertical, I mean, it's terrible, right? You, you, you can't stand up. You, know, you have to close your eyes. So when your presuppositions are challenged, that's what people feel. Okay? The world is swirling, and they just won't do it. Okay? So that's why tradition is so powerful. Tradition, okay? So powerful. Okay? And um, th so this is Zohar. He has a tradition of a moralistic universe. It's simplistic in logic. It makes sense to him. And he, he was revealed the deeper truth. He hasn't had the book of Job yet. We have, but he didn't. Okay? So let's tell him. He was deadly wrong, but you really can't blame him. <laughs> but his behavior here was deplorable. <laughs> to his friends, okay? So, in 11.1, 1, then Zohar, the Naamathite, answered. Okay, Zohar, the name means young bird. He was a descendant of Naama, uh, which means pleasant. The name appeared twice in the Bible, once for a pre-flood, a pre-Diluvian uh, female, and once for a, 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 a wife, I believe she was the first wife of Solomon and the father of uh, of Rehoboam, because Rehoboam was pretty old. He was 41 when he became king. And therefore, he was born a year before Solomon became king. Okay? So it must be Solomon's first love, first wife. And I believe that was the heroine of the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite. Okay? And she was an Ammonite. She was dark in skin. She was a shepherdess. Everything fit. Okay? And uh, uh, because this name, Naama, was used uh, in in uh, Ammon, so I believe that Zohar is probably from Ammon, okay? And then he was, uh, and Ammon was a neighboring country of Moab, that's where Job was from. Archaeology actually found out a tablet with the name Job on it in Moab, okay? And then Edom, that's from, that's Eliphaz country, and Aram or Median, they are all from descendants of Abraham or his, or his brother, and then that's where Bildad is from. He's Shuhai, well, only Shuhai, right? <laughs> no, he, he was descendant of a Shua, which is a son, who is a son of Abraham through his later wife, uh, Keturah, uh, together with Median, etc. and they were driven to the east. So he's probably from Median or Aram. Okay, so these are all neighboring countries in the east of Jordan. They are called the land of Uz. Okay, and um, so Zohar spoke. And Zohar is a willful person. Uh, that means choleric in personality, who will strongly push for what he believes to be right. Okay, that's what choleric person is. I believe this is right, this is my conscience uh, perception, this is right, it must be done, it cannot be any other way. Okay, and they're forceful usually. And uh, uh, he saw that Job successfully refuted the arguments of Eliphaz from reason and um, Bildad from emotion. So he made a willful response to shut him up. And um, in verse 2, okay. shall a multitude of words go unanswered and a talkative man be acquitted? Shall your, your foes silence men and shall you scoff and none rebuke? Okay. The emotional Bildad called Job a windbag, literally, and for saying many words that are meaningless. But he still tried to reason with Job with simplistic logic. The willful Zohar did the same accusation, that you are a windbag, and like saying that you use a multiple of wor multitude of words and you're a talkative person. And he did more, for he cannot let Job have the last word. Okay? You cannot go unanswered. Your word cannot silent man. Somebody have to stop you, and if nobody else does that, I will. Okay? And then he thinks that Job's words are dangerous. You know, you boast and you will scoff. That means you're a mocker, okay? And uh, uh, basically, he's uh, guilty of blasphemy. 
uh, accusing God of being unjust. He's saying that mu- uh, he's guilty and he must not be acquitted. Okay? They must be refuted and uh, to, re- to be rebuked. Okay? And uh, basically he believed that the wind bag is blowing toxic, toxic wind. <laughs> so he must be shut up. Okay? This is this willful friend, okay? his reaction. And when you want to shut off somebody, you, the first thing you do is you twist their word. You make them say what they didn't say. Just slightly bit off, but more absurd. Okay? And this is what uh, Zohar is doing here in verse 4. For you have said, my teaching is pure, and I am innocent in your eyes. But did Job actually say that his teaching is pure? No, he only expressed that he was confused on why God would punish him for no good reason. If if for sins is for non-apparent sin, and the degree of sin and punishment greatly mismatch, thus seemingly unjust. What is justice? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, limb for limb. Make the damage equal to the hurt, to the harm. Okay, that makes punishment equal to the harm. That is the baseline of justice. Then you adjust from that. Okay, if a person is willful killing, murdering, he needs to be killed. But if he's accidental killing, well, that's reduced to j- what's equivalent to jail sentence. You know, to to be uh, serving as a slave in a city of refuge. Okay, so those are biblical justice. And uh, apparently, what God, ha- what, well. Job perceived that God has put on him is a big mismatch with his sin. If he has any sin, it was not a big deal. But his punishment was way higher than what he deserved. Okay? He lost all his assets, all his children, and all his health. Okay? And uh, thus, he said, I'm confused. He didn't say, my teaching is pure, therefore, God, you are unjust. He does believe God is just, right? And he just said, I'm confused. It doesn't make sense to me, okay? He didn't say the boasting, my teaching is pure. I know everything. Be careful when you meet people who know all theology. (laughs) They know it all, okay? Don't know it all. But they think they do, okay? And that's why they become dangerous, okay? And especially if they're your friend, (laughs) like this one. So did Job actually say that he was innocent in your eyes? Okay, that means in God's eyes? No, he, ad- he admitted that God is too holy for any man to stand before him. And he dreamed of having a perfect mediator to stand before God for him. He did not s- claim sinless, but only righteous in the way God permitted to call man. That is after sacrifices and living with a peace of conscience. First of all, the perfect mediator we already have, Jesus Christ, right? But Job did not know. He only dreamed of such a one. He says he must exist even if he doesn't, okay? He must exist for this universe to be moral, okay? And, and he did indeed, and now we know, okay? And the second issue is, can man be called righteous? Well, God did call Noah, Job, and Daniel as sample righteous men. Okay, we know there are Christian denomination a certain school of theology would call there's no one righteous, no one under the sun. And it is also from the Bible, from Romans 3. But it really depends on what context you're talking about. Okay, if you're talking about for the sake of salvation, yes, no one is righteous before God. All our righteousness are just like dirty rags before God. And n- no one it deserves to go to heaven by our own merit. Yes, that's true. And salvation can be only free gift from God and from God alone, by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. And no doubt about that. Yes, if you're talking about salvation and relationship, that is it. Okay, no one is righteous. But when you're t- once you're talking about practical life, okay, after you are saved by Christ, we know we still sin, but we call ourselves righteous. The righteous. The Bible calls us the righteous. The saints, even in the world. Why? Okay. Well, first of all, we are counted as saints because Christ covers all our sins. Okay. There's n- no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Okay? And that we should be assured of our salvation for your sanctification to begin. Otherwise, you're always doing things to be saved. If you, if, if you sin that you thought you lost and you do some good thing to be saved, then you're saved by works. And if you're doing that, that's doing a business with God. It's never a relationship. You're never saved that way. Okay? So you have to be saved by faith and trust in Christ, in his grace and alone and love, and you're securing him, and the relationship will never be lost, and then you start your sanctification. But on the path of sanctification, you are called a saint, but you're not actually saintly all the time, at least. So what do you, how can, how can you be called a righteous? You can if you, number one, always remember the one who sacrificed for you. Okay? Jesus Christ sacrificed for you. He's covering you. If you get out of God's will, you get out of his umbrella of coverage. Then you won't be protected. But if you repent, you're under the coverage again. Okay? And if you get out, you don't lose your salvation. You just uh, receive the full consequence of your sin in this world. Okay? But if you get in, even if you sin, the consequence can be reduced. Thus, you become a blessed person. Okay? So that is uh, talking about the sanctification. And then you are... Uh, you are secure in him, and uh, uh, you can be called righteous if you remember the sacrifice. You always live everything under that umbrella, and then you live with a peace of conscience. Your conscience, natural con man's conscience, are seared by iron because they uh, sin, because sin, the world, and Satan. And uh, others do evil, and you think, oh, maybe uh, that's excessive. That's just norm. What norm is not righteous, okay? So you are righteous because of Christ, and under that umbrella, if you have no known sin, okay? And then you have a conscience that have been cleared, revived by the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And he didn't prompt you, said this you shouldn't do. Then you have freedom. You are a free agent. You're not a robot. You don't have to seek God's will for every detail. You know, what color sock do I need to wear today? It's for you to decide, okay? You are a free agent. You have realms of independence. You are you, okay? So live as your life in the realm that God permitted. And then you have peace of conscience. You are righteous. In that sense, you cannot say there's no righteous. In other words, we all live under guilt and then always bent down and then crawling. You cannot have self uh, esteem, you cannot have the, your heads up, you know, living as a man and woman in God's image, okay? You cannot have freedom and enjoyment in life, which actually God says, <laughs> everything under the sun is meaningless, <laughs> but if you consider God in your wor worldview, well, enjoy your life. That's your meaning of life, okay? So, this righteousness as a saved believer covered by Christ, you can reach it, okay? So in that sense, don't follow that, you know, guilt trip. Everyone is, you know, guilty in that sense. You be covered by Christ, live with peace and conscience, then you are a righteous person. Enjoy your life. You're free to do whatever your heart feels like to do because it's within the realm of God's will, okay? So, uh, Zohar, what he did is twisting the word of Job, and which he didn't say. Uh, so in order to shut up the opponents, you have to make their words sound worse. Okay? So this may be a good tactic, but I don't think it's righteous. Okay. Go on. Now calling for higher power, verse 5. But would that God might speak and open his lips against you? and show you the secrets of wisdom. For sound wisdom has two sides. Know that God forgets a part of your iniquity. Zohar calls on God to speak against Job because he says, you are very fluent and glib. I can't defeat you on that. But may God speak against you. Okay? So I know when I was a little kid and if somebody tried to beat me up, I, I would lie. I would say, I have a big brother. He will beat you up. You know? So you call for higher power. Okay, so here Zohar is calling for higher power. I can defeat you in words, but may God speak against you. He's, he knows more how to speak. 
and then he wants God to reveal the secrets of wisdom or the other side of wisdom to Job because sound wisdom has two sides. And Job only knows one side, his side, not God's. If God so speaks to Job, it would be a mercy that God forgets a part of your iniquity on an apparently guilty man. So in Zohar's mind, Job must be guilty, otherwise God will be unjust. That is impossible, so you must be guilty. And you're denying you're guilty, you are lying. I can't defeat you in words. May God do this to you, speaking against you. And if he speaks against you, it's because of mercy. So God does not speak to guilty persons. So that's the logic behind it. Okay. And then he lifts up a standard, make it so high that no one can reach. Verse 7. Can you discover the depth of God? Can you discover the limits of Almighty? They are high as the heavens, what can you do? Deeper than the shield, which is Hades or hell, what can you know? It is, its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. So when Satan, the serpent, asked Eve, indeed, has God said that you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Okay. When he said that, the answer is apparently no, because God didn't say that. Okay, God said you can eat from any tree of the garden except, right? So the, but the, the, the question is, did God say that you cannot eat from any tree of the garden? Of course God didn't say that. It's an easy answer. No, of course. But that easy answer of no from Eve gained an entry point for a dialogue between Eve and Satan. And once you dialogue with Satan, you will ultimately be deceived. Okay? And if you're just refusing talking to him, and then when Zohar asked Job to match God in might, knowledge, and existence over space and time, the answer apparently is, I cannot. I cannot match it. It's easy answer. But that easy answer gained a beach stand for Zohar's argument against Job. Okay? So you see what Zohar is doing? Maybe inadvertently, he's acting as Satan would act. Okay? And now the next step is to scare the opponent. Okay, verse 10. If he passes by or shuts up or calls an assembly, who can restrain him? For he knows false men and he sees iniquity without investigating. Okay. So God is a spirit, according to John 4, 24. Invisible to man, if he passes by. Uh, inaudible to man, if he shuts up. And then mightier than man, who can restrain him? And is the judge of man. He can call assembly to judge you. And Zohar so claims. God knows false men, those who claim innocence but are guilty. He sees iniquity without investigating, exclaimed by Zohar. So all he said was true, but wrongly used to break an opponent who is actually righteous. You see, you can speak partial truth. And it can hurt mightily. Okay. And that's what happened. Okay. And then the next step is to humiliate the opponent. Verse 12. An idiot will become an intelligent when the foe of a wild donkey is born a man. Okay. Zohar seems to be quoting an ancient wise saying here. It says that an idiot can become a wise man, but only when the donkey gives birth to a human. Is that possible? Impossible. So basically it says an idiot is always an idiot. <laughs> okay. So Zohar is in effect calling Job an idiot, a stiff-necked donkey, and help, hopeless in ever being changed. In text English, tex, text Anglo, whatever, uh, he's calling him a dumbass. And uh, humiliation, you know, is a necessary tactic to break the will and self-respect of an opponent. If, if a person is broken, they will say anything you want them to say. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, the police does that a lot to these suspects. They will break them. You can get a confession, and then you don't even need a, need a file, uh, the trial. You need a I know they do it, do it for law and order, but there are definitely abuses. So the next step is to goad 
for confession. 14. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and do not let uh, wickedness dwell in your tent. Then indeed you would lift up your face without moral defect, and you would be steadfast and not fear. When it is a real problem, while it is a real problem in the churches today that sin is not mentioned and calling for confession is considered offensive to seekers, the police do use multiple ways to go for confession, rightly or wrongly. And Zohar is tempting jo Job, an innocent man of the suffering he just experienced, to falsely confess sins he did not commit in order to escape fear, which Zohar just enhanced. Okay, what is he doing? We we'll, we'll we used to call it enhanced interrogation. Remember that for the terrorists. <laughs> okay, but that's what there. There's nothing new under the sun, right? The Patriot Act, all the things, is already here in Job, used, enhanced interrogation. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't know if I should laugh, but that's what <laughs> happens. Okay. The next is promise of peace. Okay. 16. For you would forget your trouble, and, and, as, and waters that have passed by, you would remember it. Your life would be brighter than no noonday. Darkness would be like the morning. Okay, Zohar promised Job that he would forget his troubles. What, uh, like waters that just pass the bridge or whirlpool, there will be no memory of the experience. But how can Job forget the loss of all his children besides the loss of all his assets and health? But Zohar promises Job that his life will be bright as the noon, and even darkness will be like the morning. Okay. And then he promises hope. Then you would trust because there is, no, there is hope. And you would look around and respect securely. You would be down and no, none would disturb. Uh, you would lie down and no one will disturb you and many would entreat you, your favor. Okay. So Zohar promised that Job would trust again in God and in his friends, who he currently does not trust. He would have real hope, unlike the current hopelessness. He would find security, unlike the current dangers and threats of his life. There would be no one disturbing him as now, and many would seek for his favor, since he would be prominent again. So if Job would do the false confession, he would have proven Satan right, that his relationship to God is only for the visible good. Okay. I don't think Zohar intended to be, so, to be Satan's helper, but that's effectively what he did. Okay. Now, there <laughs> at the end, there is the last threat. There's something called coup de grace. Do you remember? Coup de grace. Okay. If you think somebody's hurting, let's uh, kill him so he won't suffer. Okay, coup de grace. There's coup de da. That's the, 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 the regime change. The coup de grace is the mercy killing. Okay, so this is the last threat. Okay, in verse 20. But the eyes of the wicked will fail, and there will be no escape for them, and their hope is to breathe their last. If Job remains wicked, that is not confessing his sins, which must exist to keep God just, uh, just in a moralistic universe where the law of retribution is regarded to stand in all four logical forms and without special cases. As we have explained before, the law of retribution okay, means uh, the, the wicked shall be punished, okay, has four logical forms, right? There's a, a the, the reverse one, there's an in inverse one, and there is a, the, the final one. So the first and the last are equivalent, the, the middle two are equivalent. This rule actually is only stands in two of the four, not all four. Okay? And also it has special cases, as in this case, it's a special case. Okay? So for people who have simplistic logic, who have uh, less than complete revelation, uh, they couldn't perceive it, 
and that was Do- uh, Zohar and, and all of those friends. Okay, uh, So he thought he was right. He was condemning his friend, he believed, righteously, and then he believed he was doing what a good friend must do to advise for repentance. Okay, But in reality, he's serving Satan in accusing a righteous. You see how things could be inverted <laughs> and even... I mean, inadvertently, <laughs> okay, uh, unintentionally. And, uh, well, he says that if you remain wicked, Job, more harm will come to you, and you will be lucky just to die, to breathe your last breath. Okay, this will be so much fun. You'll be lucky just to die. That's the coup de grace. Yeah. What a cruel friend. But do you want such a friend? A lot of people are shaking their head no. Okay. I would like such a one if uh, it is really my fault. And he, te- uh, he tells me with, with a little more love. Okay. <laughs> okay. But this one definitely <laughs> did not show love. Okay. He, he may have told it because of love, but he didn't show any love. Okay. It was cruel. Thank God to reveal to us the truth, and thank God to give us the book, and thank God to reveal us to us the cosmic picture even more and the people in the story, so that we can now give an objective evalu- evaluation, so that we know what not to do, then we know what to do. Heavenly Father, thanks for giving us this great chapter. Uh, it's short, uh, but it's illustrative of what a friend can turn out to be a cruel agent of Satan. We pray that we will never become like that, and we pray that we do have friends who tell us the truth when we are wrong, but with love, and let us do the same too. In Jesus' name we pray. We'll conclude our singing together with doxology. And amen at the end.